a seven meter long steel beam was accidentally knocked into a spent nuclear fuel pool during work in the number three reactor building at the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. The plant operator, Tokyo Electric Power Company, says it has not discovered any serious problems as a result of the accident and the cooling system is working normally. The accident occurred on Saturday while workers were operating a large crane to remove debris at the number three reactor building. The end of the crane accidentally hit the 470 kilogram steel beam, knocking it into the cooling pool where 566 spent fuel rods are stored. TEPCO says the dosimeter at the pool showed no irregularities. It confirmed that radiation and water levels have remained constant. However, the plant operator plans to use an underwater camera to check if any fuel rods have been damaged. The government's new nuclear regulatory agency says this is a grave mistake and it will investigate the accident. Japan's Environment Ministry has decided to study wild animals in no-entry areas around the damaged Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant in preparation for the return of residents in the future. The decision follows a number of complaints about wild boars and monkeys from people who temporarily returned to their homes. Scientists believe populations of boars and monkeys, which used to be hunted, increased and their habitats expanded after people left the areas following the nuclear accident last year. The ministry plans to study habitat distributions of wild animals and seasonal changes in their activities from October to March using cameras equipped with sensors. Japanese government leaders are changing their plans as they try to define their new energy policy. They've been challenged to decide on the future of nuclear power after the accident last year in Fukushima. Their new policy suggests they'll miss a target for reducing greenhouse gases. Former Prime Minister Yukio Hatoyama set a goal of cutting emissions by 25% over 1990 levels by 2020. He made the pledge three years ago at UN headquarters. The government unveiled its new energy policy document last Friday. It said Japan would phase out nuclear energy by the 2030s. The document suggested that reducing reliance on nuclear energy would lead to more dependence on coal-fired power, power plants. It concluded that emissions could only be cut by 5 to 9 percent by 2020. Cabinet members announced their final policy on Wednesday. It turned out to be less clear about phasing out nuclear energy. And many Japanese are still trying to figure out what all this means. And joining us in now in the studio is NHK World Susumu Kojima who has been following the story. So, Susumu, what will happen to the reduction target in this new energy policy? The government officials say they haven't given up their goal to uh, cutting emissions by 25%. But the way things are, it will be quite difficult to achieve that. 25% was an ambitious target even before the accident. Government officials imagined nuclear plants as the key source of energy when they set their target. Those plants emit significantly less greenhouse gases than coal-fired plants. In fact, the government had planned to build nine new reactors to meet the target. Now only two of 50 reactors are up and running. The government is promoting energy-saving technologies and renewable energy. But for now, coal and natural gas have, re have replaced nuclear energy as the main sources of power. So what will happen if government leaders withdraw from this target? Well, as you know, the fight against climate change is a global issue. Negotiators from around the world are trying to agree on a new climate treaty by 2015. They hope to cover all major emitters, including emerging economies uh, such as China and India. Experts on climate change say if the Japanese government weakens its target, it will be a blow to the negotiations. So what next? The new energy policy announced on Wednesday is still a broad outline. We are still waiting for the details. An expert says government officials should give more consideration to climate change as they debate energy policy. I think it's necessary for the government to let the people know that both the nuclear policy 
and the climate change is important and we need to tackle those two issues uh, in a parallel manner. Government officials say they'll finalize their plans on how to reduce emissions by the end of this year. All right, so we thank you very much. French President François Hollande says he plans to close the country's oldest nuclear power plant at the end of 2016. The decision was announced during an energy policy conference in Paris on Friday. Hollande previously pledged to close the Fossenheim plant in eastern France during his term in office. This was the first time the president gave a detailed schedule. The plant will be closed before the 40th anniversary of its going into operation. Hollande has promised to reduce France's reliance on nuclear power. He reiterated a plan to lower the rate from about 80% at present to 50% by 2025. The president also stressed his commitment to developing renewable energy such as solar and wind power. He said a new investment bank to be set up by the end of this year will invest in these fields. We had um, um, aviation mechanics contacting us last year, March, April, May, um, who had detected high levels of radiation in the compressors that um, uh, an airplane has held at about um, 2,500 pounds, uh, 2,500 feet of the pressure that's at 2,500 feet. And to do that when you're way up high, they have to compress the atmosphere and run it through filters and pump it into the airplane. And we know that back in um, March, April, and May of last year, um, several planes landed in the United States and the people got off and they were radioactive and uh, it, it went away pretty quickly, but that would also imply the filters were radioactive. And we found that. We had uh, radiation mechanics contacting us and uh, telling us that the, the filters on the airplanes were, um, were highly contaminated. They had Geiger counters too and they were qualified to use them. Um, we tried to get uh, those, um, those filters, but the um, aviation companies wouldn't allow the, uh, the, these guys to send them, and, and it's difficult uh, you know, for job retention and stuff like that to, to sneak out a filter and send it to us. So we never got a filter, but we have all this data from uh, aviation mechanics that indicate last year, not, not this year, but last year, March, April, May, the, the planes on those polar routes over to Japan and um, China and Taiwan and South Korea and also Australia. We're, um, we're coming back uh, with contaminated air filters. I think the public is still very hungry for the truth about this situation because they would know how they're going to be affected and what they can do about it. I noticed uh, a lot of times that you share on not only this radio show but other radio shows, there's a lot of YouTubers that pick up the audio track and there's uh, websites that repost your information and I really applaud all those people out there that are doing that taking this information and taking it to the next step and dispersing it any and every way they can because what what you're presenting with, with, with us about what your situation is, is, your understanding of the situation, I should say, is very important and, uh, and sorely needed, and uh, I wish more and more people would do the same. So uh, we all thank you, Arnie, for what you guys are doing, and uh, you just no, listen. Show, we, go ahead. This show will probably wind up in three different languages in the next four days. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, scary, isn't it? <laughs> well, tell us about uh, what happened in Japan, why you went there, and, and what the results of that were, and what your conclusions, what you presented to the Japanese audience. Yeah, I was, um, I was sponsored to, by just a group of citizens, uh, no organization or anything like that. And, and um, you know, I, I, we, didn't, we didn't charge, but they, they paid my, my airfare over. And, uh, but in any event, um, the, uh, I had a... Uh, pretty much a speech a day for nine days, including um, including to the Diet, which is their their parliament. It was in the Diet office building, and there was about a dozen parliamentarians there, plus about 300 people. And the Japanese are different than the Americans. You don't get any feedback as a speaker. You know, when when you're an American speaker, the people will be nodding or or you know giving you some kind of encouragement. And the Japanese are, are flat, and it's, you got to get used to that. But so I gave a, a speech, it was two hours, and um, in it I had showed slides of nuclear fuel burning. It, it's up on, our, up on the Fairwinds website. And um, so the people had seen nuclear fuel burning in air, uh, which is a Sandia National Labs test. 
So after I finished, I didn't realize it, but Tokyo Electric came in uh, with NISA, the, the regulator, and they spoke for about 20 minutes about uh, the fuel pool at Unit 4, which is everybody's concern, and how, don't worry, in the next five years, they'll take care of it. So I got up then, and, and I asked, I said, real respectively, I, I said, I realize you don't believe that the fuel pool is going to crack in an earthquake. I understand that that's your position, I said. But if it does, have you prepositioned chemicals on site to put out the fire? Because it's a special kind of fire. And they, and they said, there's nothing in the fuel pool to burn. Mm. And the crowd went nuts. Wow. This was a crowd that's normally flat. They started screaming at Tokyo Electric. So it was, you know, it was a switch. They were, they were flat, and then they were the, the loudest crowd I've ever heard. So there's mm. a, an enormous amount of distrust in Japan for the regulator, NISA, and also for Tokyo Electric. And what you speak of, I believe, four is not is four the one that's actually leaning and is very susceptible to uh, further damage if a if a, a major earthquake happens. Yeah, four is the uh, the one where all of the nuclear fuel is outside the containment. And if there was a major earthquake, the, uh, it's likely the pool would crack because, like you said, it's leaning. It also has a a crack on one side of it that Tokyo Electric tried to. Um, uh, tried to um, Photoshop out of one of the pictures, but they did such a poor job it actually highlighted the crack. 